can you turn that down just a little bit, please, at the back? Thank you. Morning, everybody. How are we all? Have you ever met anybody and you've immediately thought we can be friends? Have you ever met somebody and thought, mm, maybe not? <laughs> Some research has been done about this and experts say it takes you how long to decide whether you like somebody or not. Yeah, somewhere in between according to what I read, it's three seconds. Three seconds and you decide whether you like somebody or not. And there's a bunch of things that go into that. Um, obviously, most of it is about the way you look. So what clothes you wear, uh, whether you've got hair or not, apparently. No, it's actually true. They say, they say bald men, and I'm not saying this because I'm bald, but more, bald men are apparently more powerful. So, <laughs> So Ian Mottram agrees with me totally. Um, and even the shape of your face. Or how religious you are, apparently. So when we decide whether we like somebody or not, or whether we're going to be friends with them, it only takes us a few minutes to work that out. But friendship chemistry is actually a real thing. If you want to make a lasting friendship, it will take more than just a first impression. It will take you about 40 to 60 hours to form a casual relationship. A casual friendship, sorry. It will take you 80 to 100 hours to be upgraded to being a friend. And about 200 hours to become good friends. So how long did it take you two? Sorry, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Um, but my question is, how long do you think it takes to become devoted to somebody? Now, I'm going to give you three things, and Alan was right, there is a lot in that passage. There is just a bunch. And I could probably preach for about a week on all of it. But I'm going to give you three things. So so that we know that we're becoming more devoted to one another. We, can't, we become more devoted to one another by our attitude towards each other. We become more devoted to one another by our affections towards one another. And we become more devoted to one another by our actions towards one another. And when I say about our attitude, I'm talking about our minds. Because we have, Scripture tells us, we have the mind of Christ. And you might think, well, Craig, hang on. When that's said in the Bible, it's in the Bible, in, uh, it's about the church in Corinth, and maybe it just applies to them. And that may be true. But we can have the mind of Christ, or a mind more like Christ, and I'll get to that in a moment. When we, uh, we know we're becoming more devoted to one another by our affections, by our heart. We need the heart of Christ. And we need the hands of Christ. So as I said, we can get the mind of Christ. And what is it about the mind of Christ? There are two things. He's focused on the Father and he's focused on others. Philippians 2 says, Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. In Matthew 20, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life for, as a ransom for many. A little while ago I spoke about, about selfishness here. And somebody came up to me after the service and they said, you know, Craig, the problem is the selfishness is all out there. It's not in here. And I went, 
hmm, I don't know about you, but I can be reasonably selfish. I want what I want, when I want it, and I want it now. But actually, to have the attitude of Christ is to put others first, not ourselves. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. It's about the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ is pure. He's pure with everybody. I was actually, I didn't tell you I was going to mention this, honey, and I've only just decided to do it now. Oh, she's not listening, that's all good. <laughs> but when you look at Christ's interactions, especially with the women, the woman at the well, the adulterous woman, they're all pure. A woman who's been married bunches of times before, and he's living with somebody, and Jesus is nothing but pure. The adulterous woman, he helps her out because he's pure. That's the kind of heart I want. There's a song, oh, Give Me a Clean Heart. Oh, uh, give Me a Clean Heart? Is that the name of the song? Yeah. Change My Heart? Change My Heart? Yeah, that'll do. Change My Heart. Change My Heart to be like Christ, to be more pure. The other thing about Jesus' heart is it's peaceful. There are many times where you would think Jesus might have got a bit upset. There was that one time when he turned tables in the temple. But again, like with the woman at the well, he might have said, excuse me, what do you think you're doing with your life? But he didn't. He didn't judge. He was at peace. With Zacchaeus, he didn't judge him. He was at peace with him. His heart was at peace. Psalm 34 says this, The Lord is near to the broken hearted and saves the crushed in spirit. That's the sort of heart I want. John 11.35, it's only two words long, but it tells you everything you need to know about Jesus' heart. Can anyone tell me what the verse is? Jesus wept. Thank you. Jesus wept. <laughs> tells you everything you need to know about who Jesus is. John 3.16, for God so loved, I'll try that again, for God so loved, the world that he gave so that whoever shall but and Janet Bedell's what does it say after that? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mottram thank you he came not into the world to condemn the world but to save the world because he's at peace. As people, some of us, and I'm one of them, have a flight or fight response. Do we not? We get ready to put our jukes up, or we run away. But Jesus is there and he's at peace. And then there's our actions. When we have the right actions, uh, sorry, when we have the right attitude and the right heart, the actions will follow. Jesus said, when you do it for the least of me, you do it for me. Matthew 25, starting at verse 35, which was a part of what we read. When I was thirsty, he gave me something. When I was hungry, he gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, he gave me something to drink. Jesus was about action. <coughs> he didn't come, just not that they had TV, but he didn't come to laze around. He came to save the world. And we are his disciples, so we are here to help save the world. Now, we mentioned the mask before, Mr. Booker. Thank you, Mr. Booker. 
Did anyone see the news last night? Did anyone see the protests? Yeah. In Sydney? Yeah. And in Melbourne? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? They can save themselves by wearing a mask, but they don't want to. But they can actually save themselves by accepting Christ. My question to you is how far away from Christ do you think they are? They're probably a fair way. And it's us who are devoted to one another will show people who Christ is. As we sang, as we sang in the last song, by this, people will know that we are his disciples. So there's three things. There's attitude, there's affection, and there's action. And I'm going to give you the three things that will help you become more that way. We become more Christ-like by feeding our minds with the truth. Hebrews 4.12 tells us this. The word, of the, the word of God is alive and active. Is it not? Thank you, Grace. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is light and it expels darkness, annihilates lies, destroys deception and transforms our thinking until our thoughts begin to resemble his. So, and I know I've said this before, but I'll say it one more time. When we get into the Word, we become more Christ-like. Thank you, Grace, for nodding. When we get into the Word, we become more Christ-like. Does everyone, does everyone get into the Word? Or is it just me and my wife, Grace, apparently? Yeah, okay. Cool! I want to encourage you to get into the Word. And don't just read it for reading its sake. Read it and get into it. Read it and understand it and what it's saying. And ask questions. <laughs> I'm sure you can ask myself. I'm sure you can ask John Randall. I'm sure you can ask friends who are godly friends. Because that's my next thing. We become more Christ-like when we connect with godly friends. And I love going to the village. I haven't been recently, really, but I love going to the village because there's the Motrams, then there's the Merrills, then there's the Heptons. It's fantastic. And there's Harry. Like, it's just great. It's a little church all of its own where they can discuss things and talk about Scripture and talk about God. I want to tell you a story that was told a long time ago. But there was this young guy, and he was a skateboarder, and I don't know how it happened. I think a friend of him led him to Christ and got him to church. He became a Christian. And that's great. And he thought, this is fantastic. I'm going to go and tell all my skateboarding mates about Christ. And so he kept hanging out with his skateboarding mates without hanging out with people who were godly. And he went back to the old lifestyle. To not going to church, to smoking dope, to drinking a lot. Because he wasn't hanging out with people who were directing towards Christ. We can hang out with two sorts of people. Those who direct us towards Christ or those who direct us away from Christ. I want to be the sort of person, and I know I'm not always, but I want to be the sort of person that directs people towards <coughs> Christ. And I'd like to think that most of us here would be that would want to be that sort of person too. time with other believers in community that's why I love coming to church every week 
spending time with other believers in community where you can talk about the stuff of God. Because if I went to work and talked about the stuff of God, I'd pretty much get laughed at. But I can come here and I can have a conversation with just about anybody here about what God is doing in my life. And we should be doing more of that. Not just on Sunday morning between 9 and 12, but not even for that long, really. Uh, my wife, Janet, runs um, the Her Time Prayer Group on a Monday night, every second week. Oh, no, sorry, I take that back. Every second and fourth uh, Monday of the month. So it'll be tomorrow night, because I'll have men's meetup at my house. If you'd like to come, please come and see me, because I have a very small house, and I can only take so many people. But if you'd like to come to men's meetup and discuss the things of God, please come and see me. And the third thing, and it's the most obvious, it's about spending intimate time with Christ. For those of you who don't know, I get up at five o'clock every morning and then get ready for work and then I spend time. And it gets my day off on the right foot. Sometimes, I know some people, and I used to be one of them, I'd fill my day with staff and say I was too busy to pray. I was too busy to spend time with God. But actually what the case was, I was too busy not to. If we're putting things in front of God, then what are we doing? We need to spend that time with God. And it doesn't mean you have to spend half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. I come back to what Phil Baker, who used to be the pastoral review, used to say. I don't pray for half an hour at a time, but I don't go half an hour without praying. So my thing would be, you don't have to spend half an hour with God, like communing with God, but don't go half an hour without communing with God. And if you get those two things, as I said before, the actions will come. Because if you have the right mind and the right heart, then I'm sure Galatians 5.22 will become pretty easy. Who knows what Galatians 5.22 is? Thank you. The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is... Hang on, hang on. What's the first one? Love, second. Third. Fourth. Yeah, keep going. Well, I've actually got goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But that's okay. You've done well, people. Congratulations. If I had chocolates, I'd give them to you, but I don't. And against these things, there is no such law. Those who belong to Christ have been crucified in the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited or selfish, provoking and envying each other. Because we need, we're called, we don't need to be, but we're called to be devoted to one another. Called to be devoted to one another. What does that mean for you? Maybe that means praying for people. Maybe that means cooking meals for people. Maybe that means taking people out for coffee. Or making a phone call. What does that mean for you? What does it mean to be devoted to one another? What I suggest you might want to do this week is have a pray about that. And not only how you can be devoted to people, but who you can be devoted to. Who can you be devoted to? I'm sure there are people in this congregation who might love a phone call, or being taken out for a coffee, or having a meal cooked for them, whatever it happens to be. Or just a text message to say, hey, just thinking of you. It's about relationship. 
If we don't have a relationship, we can't be devoted. If we don't have a relationship, we can't be devoted. Be devoted to one another. And it doesn't have to be huge. Just little small things. And by this, everybody will know that we are his disciples. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your, not only your word, Lord, but the example of your son, his mind, his heart, and his actions, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, that uh, we have this. Lord, not only in your word, but in our own heart. Because Jesus is living in us today. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you sent your son to die for our sin so that we could have a relationship with you. And Lord, may as we go out this week, may we be devoted to one another, Lord. Whether it's in big ways or small ways, whatever way it is, Lord, May we be devoted to one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.